that's something we do each week or each, excuse me, not each week, but each meeting. And you've had a chance, if you've looked at the agenda to review those. Also as part of our agenda, we have our purpose and goals <clears throat> very quickly to just look at our four goals, develop an understanding of the district's budget and financial issues, recommend to the Board of Education through the superintendent ideas related to reducing expenditures or increasing revenue towards a more balanced and focused budget, contribute to improved communication, committee, staff, community, students, and parents to enhance understanding of the district's budget and financial condition, and contribute to and support a transparent and collaborative budget process. So for our agenda today, the bulk of our time will be spent going through a review of our first interim. The first interim has been published for the board as part of our board agenda. However, it has not been formally presented to our board in the meeting that takes place on Wednesday. So for the public who might be watching or for other staff, this may be the first time they've had a review of this information. And what I would ask our task force members to do is look at this information within the context of how we help engage the community and staff with our future budget issues and, and discussions. One of the things that's certainly on the forefront of what we're doing is we have some town halls scheduled for next week, where we'll be talking a little bit about our fiscal picture. What are some important points that you think we should be making? And then the other part of that is what are things that you think are important considerations for us? And as Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer goes through the first interim presentation and report, uh, there at the time continues to be good news from Sacramento. For example, our November revenues exceeded expectations across the state. And so I think there's a lot of people waiting to see what the state budget proposal looks like from the governor in January, which a few weeks ago felt like a really long ways away, but somehow in just a few weeks, it seems like it's right around the corner. So with that, we'll open it up for the uh, presentation. And let me, excuse me, let me stop for one minute. Uh, before we do the presentation, this is a meeting that we live stream, and we may oftentimes have people who reach out for public comment, even though the superintendent's budget advisory task force is not subject to the Brown Act. Now, I have not received any public comment. Uh, Ms. Sandoval, have you received any public comment or any participants that we may want to see if they have public comment? There is no comment right now. Thank you very much. So moving on from that, uh, I will turn it over to Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer, who will review a PowerPoint presentation with us related to the first interim. <clears throat> what I will say before she starts that is remember that it was not very long ago when at this time we were having a meeting talking about notice from the county, future budget cuts coming in the middle of the year and the end of the year. And I believe when I started last August, our current first year reserve was right around 4% or just below 4%. And we've done a lot of work to try and resolve our fiscal condition through reductions through looking at every single way we can adjust. And then of course, a huge influx of one-time money from the state and federal government for COVID relief. So our numbers will look a little different this, this time around with our first interim, and I'm happy that they look different, uh, but we wanna be mindful of, of where we are and where we're going. Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer, please uh, take it away. Patty, will you be able to share the presentation for us? I tried a couple of times and for some reason I can see all my other screens except that one. Okay, I can certainly try on one, please. Thank you. One page for 
Uh, park in window. There we go. Okay. Can you all see that? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Okay. So the first interim report captures all of the expenditures that we've had as to um, as of October 31st. So we adopted the budget in June and we look at July, August, September and October and we compare our year to date expenditures to a budget. And the first interim report then is an opportunity for us to update our budget to be more in line with our expenditures. Next slide, please. Okay. There we go. So the, the board received the adopted budget in June, 45 days after the adopted budget, we brought to the board what's called a 45 day budget revision. And in that revision, we accounted for additional revenues with, uh, we also accounted with less expenditures, which brought what we expected our deficit spending to go from $14.3 .3 million to $10.1 million. And we increased our reserve from 6.22 to 7.24. This was from adopted budget to now our 45 day uh, budget revision that took place 45 days after the budget was adopted. We're now at first interim report. So how do we compare from our first interim report from, I'm sorry, for the, from the 45 day budget revision? And um, our revenue has increased an additional $11 million from the $416 million at the 45 day revision. Our expenditures also increased and our deficit spending at first interim is now $11.5 million, a decrease from our 45 day revision of $1.3 million. So at first interim, we are our ending fund balance or our reserve is 12.08%, an increase of 4.8, almost 5% from our 45 day revision. Next slide, please. So what's happening is on the unrestricted side of the house, our revenues are 30, $342 million on the restricted side, $84 million. And for a total of our first interim revenue of $427 million, our expenditures are estimated to be $438.6 million, which then in, um, our deficit spending is 11.5. So what does deficit spending mean? Is that we are spending more money than we anticipate we're going to receive. And so where does this money come from? If we have $427 million and we're spending 438, where's this the $11.5 million come from? It comes from our beginning fund balance, which at this point in time, when the books were closed is $77.3 million. So our ending fund balance after deficit spending is now 65.8, or at least that's what we're estimating. Of the $65.8 million, we're designating 12.8 and leaving a reserve of $53 million, which is 12.08. So why are we having this 12 point or $53 million? So there's a couple of things. One of them is that we're looking at our cliff that's coming into the following year. So this picture is only for this fiscal year and not for the two subsequent years. We're gonna talk about our multi-year projections. So why do we have to have a $53 million fund balance or reserve? Because we need to have those that fund balance to be able to accommodate the reduction in revenue because of the declining enrollment that the district is experiencing. Next slide, please. So the assumptions that we use for revenue, there's an increase of $400,000 in our local control funding formula. This also reflects an increase of $15.3 million in federal funding. And that's what uh, uh, 
uh, Superintendent Kamek was referring to, we have an additional, a lot of additional one-time money that's that's looking at, uh, is showing in our coffers. State revenue, we have a decrease, an overall decrease of $3.4 million. And our local revenue, an increase of less than, a, a little bit less than a million dollars. We can go to the next slide. Additional information for all of these is located in the book that was also attached on the agenda in uh, on the agenda for the board meeting this Wednesday. So ma major expenditures. So one of the things that we did is we were able to identify expenditures that were on the unrestricted side of the house that um, really needed to be charged to our one time monies. So you'll see that um, there's an overall decrease of one point nine million dollars in certificated salaries and classified salaries, an increase of 1.3. Um, very little in employee benefits, um, almost a million, a decrease in capital, uh, capital expenditures, and an increase in expenditures for books and supplies due to all this additional uh, categorical funding that we're receiving, and then services and operating expenses, an additional $3.9 million. Next slide, please. So in our, in our multi-year projections, these are the assumptions that we used. We're looking at our enrollment projections being at 33,174 and 32,772 in the 22, 23, and 23, 24 year. Our unduplicated pupil presented, a percentage is a slight decrease, but we're looking at a three-year rolling average, which works well for us so that the impact in our and our uh, supplemental funding is not as as um, as severe because we have declined in enrollment. Um, our COLA that we're using for those two subsequent years is 2.48 and 3.11. Federal funding, um, there's not a lot of change that we're going to see in federal funding. State revenue, we're going to see um, these are the assumptions that we're using for mandated costs, for lottery, and for special education. And then our local control, uh, our, our local revenue, we're still looking at receiving funding from our parcel tax. Next. So one of the things that we accounted for in the multi-year projections is the program changes that are taking place. Um, this year, we're looking at um, our RICS preschool program starting that was already included in the budget. So that's not reflected here, but just want to reassure everyone that the staff that's needed to be able to open the preschool, the Rick's preschool has been included in the first interim report. Also, um, we've included in the multi-year projections, if the board decides to open Lila Bringhurst next year as an elementary school, we have included the cost of the staffing that's necessary for um, the reopening or the brand new opening of that school. In addition to the office staff, we increased the teaching staff by six, or not increased, but we've added six positions for us to be able to accommodate that school. And the middle schools are slated to, Thornton, Centerville, and Hopkins are slated to open in 22, in, I'm sorry, 23 and 24, and that is to include our sixth graders. So we've added the additional cost in, in staff for office staff and so on and so forth. At this point in time, we did not increase. We have not added additional certificated teaching staff. The assumption is that the teachers that were teaching in the elementary schools when possible will follow the students when they moved into sixth grade at now what are going to be our new middle schools. The other thing that this first interim uh, report tackles, which is something that um, we have not uh, tackled recently, is textbook adoptions. Um, we have been notified by by uh, the textbook gurus or the the, the textbook um, publishers that the textbooks that we're currently using will no longer be published and no longer be supported. So we have to have to have to have to. Um, have our textbook adoptions. So we've added 
in addition to the two and a half million dollars that we already set aside every year for textbooks, an additional $2.5 million in 22-23 and $3.5 million in 23-24 so that we can uh, continue with the textbook adoptions. We're also making adjustments to our FTEs as it pertains to the declining enrollment. In order for us to be able to maintain the solvency of the district, we have to be able to use attrition to make the necessary adjustments at FTE. If students are not here, then um, the need for teachers, of course, is reduced and the district is in declining enrollment. So through attrition, what does attrition mean? It means that when somebody resigns, we don't fill the position and that's how we would accommodate the loss. If we don't have students, then we need less teachers. Less teachers, we don't hire for, excuse me, for positions that either people have retired or resigned from. The other thing that we are able to accomplish through this first interim is the implementation of Transitional Kinder. Transitional Kinder is a program that's becoming mandatory as of next year, and it's um, allowing students at a younger age to attend school. Unfortunately, it's not a fully funded program, but we are mandated to offer it. So at this point in time, we're, we're uh, increasing the staffing to accommodate for transitional kinder, uh, 10 FTE, uh, for uh, a total of um, 10 FTE, and then for 22-23, and an additional 28 paraprofessionals. Because the transitional kinder program requires that for every 12 students, we have one adult. So if we're gonna to continue to off, have 24 students in the classroom, our goal would be to have a teacher and a paraprofessional. So we've accommodated for that cost in our multi-year projections in 22-23. And in 23-24, we're looking at an additional 10 FTE for certificated staff and additional 10 paraprofessionals. That cost has also been included in our multi-year projections. Next, please. So this is to show that included in our, in our multi-year projections is an average of one and a half percent of a step and column move for our employees. You've been here, if you work a year and you still have steps on the salary schedule you'll replace, we're accommodating for that change. We're also accommodating for the increased cost and pension contributions. Next slide, please. So as far as the assumptions are concerned, we're also ensuring that our capital, that supplies and services, capital outlay, and also the transfer for mission ROP is still in our budget and that our, and we're accommodating the increase in cost of special education um, in our multi-year projections as well. Next. So what we're looking at now is our first interim report. We're expecting to have a 12.08% reserve. In 22-23, it drops to 11.29. Again, this is to accommodate um, the cliff that uh, we're going to experience unless the legislation and the governor do something about maybe extending are um, hold harmless or a rolling three-year average. And then the year after that, 23-24, we're looking at a reserve of 9.45%. <coughs> was that a question, Mr. Musto? I thought I saw your arm go up, no? I was, I was waving goodbye to our secretary. Oh, okay, Sorry. all right, no problem. And may I have the next slide, please? So there's a designation of $12.8 million in our fund balance, and that's um, designated designations that are, for example, non-spendable, which is money that we have set aside in inventories and in our revolving account, uh, restricted. We have $3.8 million in our fund balance for restricted. That can't be used. We do have a set aside of 1% variance. Um, it, as we move along through this fiscal year and through the future months, if there's any adjustments that we need to make to the budget, we have this, this reserve variance of 1%. Uh, there's also the possibility of a cost of $3 million um, to address PEMCA, the minimum contribution to employees. 
Um, there's also the medical administrative activities that is a set aside, something we can't touch. And then this is a new requirement that we show as a designation, the fair market value of um, the, the funds that we have with our treasurer. There's mandated cost site allocations that we also can't touch. So these $12.8 million are set aside. Next. This is a snapshot of all the other funds that the district has. You'll notice that um, there are no change to the special education pass-through from um, our first, uh, our adopted budget to first interim. Same thing for adult ed. We're still showing a 1.7 ending fund balance, no change to the child developer, uh, child development fund, cafeteria fund. We're expecting to have an ending fund balance of about $100,000. Our Fund 21, um, we're expecting to spend all of Fund uh, 21, except that I, it, we usually show it as, as encumbered and it's definitely been committed, but um, most likely we will not spend all of the money because we still have construction projects that will take us for the next few years. Um, the Fund 35, we have a zero uh, change to Fund 35 special reserve fund, there's $2.6 million that we expect to have in our ending fund balance. The interest and redemption fund, this is this is the fund that's managed by the county office, and that's where the bonds, the general obligation bonds are paid from. We'll have a $32.2 million ending fund balance. Our self-insured fund balance will not change, and our charter schools, independent uh, schools, uh, charter school, Circle of Independent Learning as a $700,000 ending fund balance. Next slide, please. So the things to consider when you see this budget are two things. One is the that uh, we're still in negotiations with all of our bargaining units. Negotiations will certainly uh, have an impact on our ending fund balance, or our reserve. And the minimum contribution that we just talked about can certainly have an impact on our current ending fund balance. And I believe, can we go to the next slide? These are the next steps. We uh, presented the unaudited actuals in September, uh, December 8th. We're presenting the first interim in January. The governor usually by January 10th presents this proposal for the 22-23 budget. That's where we usually take most of our assumptions to start developing the 22-23 budget for the district. Um, the, the board should receive the audited financials. Our auditors go through our unaudited actuals and they, they review them for accuracy. And there's a presentation that, that the board receives about our audited financials. Uh, the next time we'll be looking at our financials is at second intro, which we expect will be March 9th. And then um, the governor's May revise is also a very important component of us developing our budget for next fiscal year. And then in June of 22, we bring to the board the next year's budget for budget adoption. And that concludes my presentation and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Associate Su Superintendent Pfeiffer. A couple of things I just wanna put out there for everybody as we engage in questions and feedback. Uh, these are just things that I'm hearing at the state level. Uh, what we heard, for example, I believe it was last week, they had the uh, subcommittee hearing at the state level for education and finance. And I think O'Donnell was leading that meeting and Mike Fine from uh, FICMAT was making some recommendations. And I think it's an important note because we talk a lot about advocacy and a lot of the things that have been advocated for in recent years, we're starting to actually hear some discussion about at the state level. So a couple things I just want to throw out there. We don't know if these will turn into realities, but we were, I'm hopeful that some of them will. One is we heard a recommendation from Mike Fine at FICMAT that they might want to consider looking at a three-year rolling average for attendance. So right now, uh, you know, or you may know that we are permitted to use the higher of our last two years. And the challenge with that is for districts that are growing, uh, they want to use the higher because they may have new students. For districts that are declining in enrollment, they will want to use the higher to to protect against 
of the decrease in revenue. But what that creates for districts that are declining is a cliff because sooner or later, they have to face that dramatic drop in enrollment. And so what they're looking at is using a three-year average, which would be beneficial because for districts that are declining in enrollment, which is almost every district in the state, it lessens the, the steep angle of that decline in revenue. And so that is something that I think is worth watching. We'll have to see if it gets any traction in the governor's proposal, but it was discussed at the state uh, subcommittee hearing for education and finance. The other thing that we're hearing is a lot of advocacy for the base level of LCFF to increase. And that's where, in my opinion, we want to see the increases if there is extra state revenue, because that raises all of the other amounts from there, the supplemental, the concentration dollars, they all got, they all get raised off of that base level LCFF increase. A few other things that we're hearing, it is anticipated we may see more one-time monies, uh, which is good. We never want to say no. Uh, but we prefer that money is ongoing so that we can build staffing and programs around ongoing uh, revenues because those generally have ongoing expenditures. The risks that we're hearing at the state level, a lot of them are surrounded around inflation and, and what's going to happen with that. And we are hearing and seeing publications from the Legislative Analyst Office that we could see an increase in the projected COLAs for the out years. So what that means for us, as you know, is we take the COLAs that school services publish, we measure those against what the legislative analyst office publishes. Then usually there's a group from uh, county uh, school business association leaders that come up with a figure and we take all of those and we figure out what we wanna use for COLA. A lot of the times all those agencies align Sometimes they have discrepancies and we may want to split the difference between the two for our projections. But as you saw in the presentation, our out year colas are somewhere around three and 2%, correct, Nancy? Okay. And so if we see an increase in those colas in the out years, that would be good. Uh, but we have to see what develops. The first time we'll get our eyes and ears on that is the beginning of January. We'll hear what the governor proposes. And then usually shortly after that, the legislative analyst uh, office does a real nice debrief. And then there's a lot of lobbying that happens between then and the May revise. But those are some of the trends that we're starting to hear at the state level. Some of you, I saw a couple head nods when I mentioned the state subcommittee meeting. You might be tracked into some of those conversations that are happening as well. So let's open it up for questions, feedback, uh, thoughts on the first interim or or next steps for Fremont Unified with, with our budget. Susan, go ahead, please. Um, pardon me for asking these questions, um, but when Nancy mentioned the textbook adoptions, do you know specifically what content areas? I know that a few years back, we adopted the English language arts program, uh, program. I'm curious to know if they, if it's science, I know we adopted this past year social studies, or if it's mathematics, have they given you any indication as to which content areas, specifically at the elementary level? I will have to, to check. I have that information. I just don't have it in front of me. Mm -hmm. I believe we're looking at a, um, a few different, some are smaller, some are larger. And I just, I don't want to misspeak because I don't have it in front of me. That's I funny. think most of them are, are secondary. I don't think that any of them at this time uh, for the next, uh, this, this school year are elementary. Okay. But I, I want to put a caveat on that, that I need to go back and double check. I have one other question. I know that this year our children are entitled to, or they're allowed to get free lunches. Will that continue next year? And is that funding source, um, from the federal government and is it encroaching on the general fund at all so great questions i don't know if it will continue next year mm -hmm. um, we are being mindful of the impact of that because mm -hmm. one of the things that we're seeing and this is something again that we're lobbying for is some help at the state level and the federal level for this because normally that free and reduced meal program is a way for us to capture 
some of our Title I dollars, uh, mm -hmm. excuse me, not the dollars, but the participation rate right. impacts uh, our qualifying status. And so we also have an implication there for the unduplicated percentage. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to see how those are impacted because with free meals being offered, families may be less inclined to fill out all the paperwork that they would historically to qualify for the free and reduced meal program. In terms of the encroachment on the general fund, the food service program itself, uh, we'll have to see what happens this year, but in prior years, it has required a contribution. And uh, I think I maybe answered this earlier, but the funding for that is from the federal level. Mm -hmm. And Nancy, for, please forgive me if I'm wrong, or maybe you can correct me, but I believe the mechanics of that uh, because we've had some people ask is we do our meal counts and then we get the reimbursement. So it's not necessarily something that we're getting an upfront dollar amount for. Is that, well, does that ring true? That is correct. The concerns that we have, if I may, Superintendent Kamek, is that while well, the federal government is, is ensuring that this year all students eat at no cost, that is not uh, slated to be the case next year, but mm -hmm. the requirement of offering meals so all students will be there. So there's going to be a decrease in the reimbursement that the district's going to have. So the district is anticipating an encroachment or um, a contribution from the general fund of $700,000 starting next year. This year, we're not anticipating an encroachment because, again, uh, the federal government and the state are ensuring that there's no cost to students. So we're getting full reimbursements, but we're not expecting that to be the case next year. So we're anticipating an encroachment of $700,000. Okay, thank you. Brandon, please go ahead. Hi, um, I just had a quick question about um, why PEMCO, um, PEMCO was placed where it was in the presentation and not under benefits as deficit spending. Are you referring to the $3 million? Yeah, because it said um, benefits, there was one slide that had benefits as like 0.5, I think. And then later on, it said, um, because PEM, PEMCA is part of benefits, so shouldn't they be together? I w so I was confused about the placement yes. of that. If I may, the, the, there's, there's a couple of things happening. Starting November 1st, the district is covering the cost of PEMCA. That's included in our cost. There's a potential exposure um, of a recent occurrence of almost $3 million that we want to just keep an eye on. And that's why there's a set aside. It hasn't been spent, but we're planning for the potentiality of having an additional out-of-pocket cost of potentially one time to address that. And that's why it's a set aside and not part of our expenditures. Okay. And to, to those who may be watching or who are on the call that may not be familiar with PEMCA, <clears throat> to summarize that briefly, the district has a JPA, Joint Powers Authority, that provides our benefit program, and that is CalPERS. And there's a requirement under CalPERS that for the employees who participate in the benefit program, which for us is around 650 employees across the whole district. Uh, there's an administrative fee that needs to be paid to PEMCA. And right now that's uh, $143 per employee. And we were notified uh, earlier in the school year uh, through the, the summer that the district had not properly made those payments in years past. And so we have an obligation to negotiate the effects of that with our bargaining groups. We're doing that currently. And that's what Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer is, re is referring to in terms of that potential exposure. So we may have some uh, things that we need to do to remedy the past issue that's taken place. And as Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer described, effective uh, November 1st, the the amount has been paid and so that's rectified already moving forward and so now we need to figure out what what happens for the things that have happened previously and so that's what uh president dorsey's question was regarding 
And I just wanted to provide some additional context to that. And as Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer highlighted, the ongoing implications of that are already in our budget projections. And the set aside is to address what may be past needs. Any other questions from the group or things that you would want us to be thinking about uh, as we move forward? Trustee Jones. Yeah, I just have a question when it comes to knowing that we're in declining enrollment and so there's going to be an impact on the number of FTE that we need. And we talk about handling that with, you know, attrition and retirement because we don't want to lay people off for sure. Um, how what happens when, say, you have the enrollment reductions we're seeing in elementary primarily, at least initially, but we're seeing um, retirements happening, say, in secondary, where you don't have... So my question is, what do we do when we see, say, the, re the attrition not happening in the grade levels that we need to handle where we're seeing the declines in enrollment? How are we able to usually balance that or are we going to find ourselves in in kind of a pickle figuring out how to manage that great question i think if we continue at the rate of declining enrollment that we had this year which was an uptick even above our projections we could in very short time be in a situation where we may need to be looking at layoffs um, i think that given our current circumstance we should I don't want to say definitively yet, but we should be able to deal with our staffing needs through attrition. So, uh, for example, with the rate of decline that we saw this year, I think that would have equated to a, if we just took it holistically about 25 or 30 teachers and our natural attrition and rehire is in the, the 100 to 150 plus. Now, you bring up a good point, Trustee Jones, of what happens if those don't fall exactly in the places that we need them. With those numbers, we should likely still be okay, but even with the decline in enrollment we saw last year, we still had a need, especially in uh, areas of math, science, special ed, uh, and we even ended up uh, needing multiple subject credentials. So I think we'll still need to be doing some hiring, but we'll have to be very mindful of where we're seeing retirements and resignations to make sure that our enrollment projections match that staffing need. And we okay. usually start that work uh, right when we come back from winter break and we start looking at projections for staffing. We start to do the roll up for students and we may have schools, for example, if they've had a significant decrease this year, where we start to prepare with that site administrator for a decrease in staffing. And on the certificated side, we have contract language that outlines how we go through that process for moving uh, teachers from one site to the next or one. And that's based on credentialing if it's at the secondary level. So we look at all those things. Yeah, and I know the one other thing that I want to keep in mind about that is that this all assumes that we keep class sizes as they are. And I know, you know, anytime since we were, I, I think I've said this before, when we were in such a period of growth and we were just packing kids everywhere, this this period of declining enrollment, as as bad as it is, you know, there's there are opportunities there, right? We we could try to utilize this to right size our campuses and perhaps bring class sizes down a bit. And I know there are serious budget implications to that um, that we cannot overlook, but I don't want to assume that we can't do it. I want to keep an open mind that maybe we can find a way in the budget to reduce our class sizes a bit as we face these declines. And, and you know, perhaps that will allow us to, again, keep some FTE if we, if we need to. So I, I just want to be open-minded about that being a possibility. I don't want to write it off. Yeah, I think it's a great thing to be to be open towards and looking to see how we can be creative. I do want to uh, put the caveat out there that our first interim is built around the projections where when our enrollment decreases, we're making the corresponding adjustment to staffing. 
And so sometimes we can, we can get creative and find solutions and find ways to, to do things that, that are beneficial. But when we large scale, broad brush, when we look at that first interim, it's built on a reduction of staffing each year that corresponds with the reduction in enrollment. But that certainly is something to consider and, and we can explore how do we how do we utilize the circumstances that we're facing to the best of our ability because uh, we we certainly aren't in isolation in the decline in enrollment. Yeah, and I just I also just see that as a as something as we've faced, you know, the learn I hate using the term learning loss, but I'm going to because unfinished learning functioning unfinished learning that we know that smaller class sizes help with that you know the more attention a teacher can give to each student the better they are so um it, it's just something i have in my heart that i want to do because i know it's good it's good for everybody when we can keep class sizes lower and i just i wish that the state would fund us differently so we didn't see this decline as we lose students because if we could keep the same funding, there's a lot that we could do. And it, it's, I, I keep, I, you know, I keep on top of our legislators and, you know, they're not terribly receptive to some of my suggestions, but I keep at it. Thanks, Trustee Jones. And I saw a hand go up for Margaret. Yes, Trustee Jones and I were on the same thoughts about enrollment, so it was asked and answered. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. So we've got just a few minutes left. I think four minutes. Are there any other things that uh, you might think are important uh, for me to, uh, to highlight as we enter into next week and go through some of our budget town halls? Um, you know, I, I, I do think in a sense there's a, there's a celebration, maybe too strong a word, uh, but I do think we should recognize that we're in a much better fiscal position than we were a year ago. And, uh, you know, again, a lot of that is contributed to the fact that we got a significant amount of one time money from the state and federal government. But there are attributes as well to reductions that have been made. And that unfortunately impacts the district in a negative way. Uh, but we have made some tough decisions in the last year to try and get our budget into a much healthier place. CJ, you're on mute. I don't think he's on mute. I think his headphones went out. Oh, your headphones, maybe. You have me now? Okay, so uh, what I was saying was that our budget is in a much better position than it has been. But as Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer was pointing out, we have some things that will continue to impact that. Uh, we're at the table for negotiations with our employee groups, and that's a good thing. We want to see what we can do to help recognize the excellent work of our employees and to help recruit and retain the best employees for Fremont Unified. And we also have to be looking at what the future holds in other areas. So uh, it's it's a much more exciting time to be in the position than we're in now than we were a year ago. But as the old saying goes, some of the most difficult financial times come from decisions that are made when there is money. Uh, so we want to be very, very smart about what we're doing now that we've improved our fiscal position. Anything else for the group before we wrap up? Uh, if you're really into streaming meetings, uh, don't forget you can tune into our board budget subcommittee meeting brought to you by Fremont Unified School District. That'll take place at five on channel X or whatever channel it's on, starring some of your favorite local people. <laughs> uh, if I can remind, uh, let's see, Susan, Brandon and I, if you could please enter present in the chat so that I can record your presence here today. Thank you so much.
Uh, could we have your autograph for all of those rock stars that are going to present at the town hall meeting? <laughs> all right, we're going to uh, wrap this meeting up. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Thank you for uh, your participation and your questions. And uh, I look forward to the town hall meetings. I look forward to uh, the board meeting on Wednesday. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care.